Coming up next, America's top ten. Widows. Cut our fist. Go back, go back. <laughs> no flowers will bring him back. Nothing will. We do it. We pull the next big one, Harry lined up. Their grief is strong. Widows, next Monday at 10.25 on Channel 4. Every day, thousands of jobs are waiting to be filled. In fact, one in three firms predict skill shortages will affect output. That's why the government is investing in employment training and why companies like IBM, Wimpy, Sainsbury's, Pilkington, Ferranti International and ICI are committed to ET. So let's train the workers without jobs to do the jobs without workers. Details phone 0800 24 6000. Quick Fit's massive tire and exhaust sale is now on with a huge range of top quality exhausts with a two year free guarantee. But you better hurry. Get down to our sale. Only the lonely. The unmistakable voice of Roy Orbison no on the definitive I greatest hits album. Hey, woman. 20 original hits from one of the true legends of pop music. Including Pretty Woman and Crying, Dwing Dreams and Blue Bayou. Relive the unique sound of the legendary Roy Orbison. The greatest hits on Telstar now. Want to build up your savings? Get into Halifax Instant Extra. Start with just £500, but the more you put in, the more you benefit, as the interest steps up to our most powerful rate. Take out your money anytime. You won't lose interest. So get a healthy return on your investment with Instant Extra. From the Halifax. Don't miss it. The Payless DIY sale now on all across the country with quids off all kinds of DIY. Call Speakeasy, the national chat line service. Phone now on 0898 444 888. Want to know all about the New Year programmes on ITV and Channel 4? Make sure you get TV Times. David Suchet talks of his role as Hercule Poirot in the new Agatha Christie series. We preview High Street Blues, drama with a difference, as shopkeepers battle with developers. Read how the cast of Wish Me Luck met real resistance heroes. Savour Hugh Johnson's advice about supermarket wine. And this week, get a free birth sign pendant and a half-price senior citizen's rail card in TV Times. Thames, with great entertainment in Minder. So, your name, sir? McCann. Where a friend in need is a friend in debt. Look, Teller, I'm desperate for this day off. Is it legal? 
Of course it is. I wouldn't drop you in it, would I? The place is nothing but trouble. In the absence of a member of the bar, I would like to act on Mr McCann's behalf. Minder on Thames next Monday at 9. Hello again, good morning to you. Time now for our final nighttime programme this week. Casey Kasem introduces the top singles of 1988. So without further ado, let's cross the Atlantic for America's top 10. From Hollywood, a special edition of America's Top Ten. This week, Casey counts down the ten biggest records of 1988 with Whitney Houston, Guns N' Roses, George Michael, Three, George Harrison, In Excess, Rick Astley, Tiffany, Steve Winwood, and Belinda Carlisle. Now, here's Casey Kasem. Thank you, Charlie, and hello again, everybody. Welcome to another special edition of America's Top Ten. Now, here we go with our exclusive countdown of the 10 biggest singles of 1988. At number 10 in our survey is a song by a rock and roll veteran who isn't getting older, he's just getting better. He began hitting the top 10 back in 1957 with classics like I'm a Man and Gimme Some Lovin'. And 21 years later, he's still recording classics like the number one song, which gives him the 10th hottest song of 1988. Here is Steve Winwood and Roll With It. with the title song from his album, Roll With It, the 10th most popular song of 1988. At number nine is the first of four newcomers with songs among the year's 10 biggest, and that's really a good showing for new musicians. There's a band from London who rocketed to stardom with their stylish arrangements and slick videos. Here's the band called Breathe, with the ninth hottest song of the year, Hands to Heaven. Glasper on lead vocals that breathe with the song at number nine for the year, Hands to Heaven. 
At number eight is the only teenager in our survey, a woman who could do no wrong during 1988. She finished off 1987 with her number one remake of I Think We're Alone Now, and then began 1988 with her second number one, Could Have Been, followed by I Saw Him Standing There at All This Time. And it's Could Have Been that winds up at number eight among the year's top hits for Tiffany. Sweet words you whispered Didn't mean a thing I guess our song is over As we begin to sing Could have been so beautiful Could have been so right Could have been my love Every day Tiffany Darwish from the Los Angeles suburb of Norwalk, California, at number eight among the year's top hits with Could Have Been. Now, I don't know if this indicates a spiritual revival in America or not, but two of the songs in our countdown of the top hits of 1988 are about the posthumous paradise called Heaven. Back at number nine, we had Hands to Heaven by Breathe. Now, right here at number seven, we've got Belinda Carlisle relocating Heaven in Heaven is a Place on Earth. Former go-go, Belinda Carlisle, in a video directed by actress Diane Keaton at number seven among the top songs of the year, Heaven is a Place on Earth. Well, in 1988, Whitney Houston continued to rack up her string of number one songs, hitting with her fifth and sixth consecutive number one before finally breaking that string. And one of those number ones ranks as the sixth hottest song of the year. Here's Whitney Houston's So Emotional.
Whitney Houston, successful fashion model turned wildly successful pop star at number six for the year with her number one smash, So Emotional. There's only one heavy metal tune among the year's top ten, and it's by the heavy metal crew that's dominated the sound during 1988, the current kings of the headbangers. Guns N' Roses at number five with Sweet Child of Mine. sound of W. Axel Rose on vocals coupled with the unmistakable look of Slash on lead guitar. Guns N' Roses at number five for 1988 with Sweet Child of Mine. Now, before we get back to the biggest singles of 1988, let's take a look back at the top ten singles of ten years ago. The top ten of 1978. At number ten, Three Times a Lady. Nine, Boogie Oogie Oogie. Eight, Love is Thicker Than Water. Seven, Baby Come Back. Six, How Deep Is Your Love? Five, Kiss You All Over. Four, Stayin' Alive. Three, You Light Up My Life. Two, Night Fever. And number one, Shadow Dancing. We're counting down the 10 biggest songs of 1988 here on America's Top 10, and we're up to the song which lands at number four. It's the biggest song of the year for a newcomer. A newcomer has been described as a young white kid with a voice straight out of Motown. He had two number ones during 88, Never Gonna Give You Up and Together Forever. And it's Never Gonna Give You Up that lands at number four among the top songs of the year. From Britain, here's Rick Astley. We're no strangers to love. You know the rules and so do I. I feel commitments while I'm thinking of. Yeah. 
Gastly, born and raised in the town of Newton the Willows in England, at number four for the year, with Never Gonna Give You Up. At number three is the oldest act in our survey, a man whose music changed the world back in the 60s, and these days as a singer, songwriter, and film producer, he's still casting a long shadow on modern culture. Here's former Beatle, George Harrison, Got My Mind Set On You. I 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 got my mind set on you. And this time I know it's real. The feelings that I feel. I know if I put my mind to it. I know. That's 45-year-old George Harrison in a very strange room singing the third biggest song of the year, Got My Mind Set On You. Well, six of the songs among the top ten of 1988 are by foreign acts, and the one that lands at number two is by the only foreign act in our survey not from Britain. They're a band from Australia who spent the past year establishing themselves as one of the most important acts of the decade. Here is In Excess, Need You Tonight. Yesterday, you can care all you want. Everybody does, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So slide in here and give me a moment. You make us all so raw. I've got to let you know. I've got to let you know. With Michael Hutchins on lead vocals, that's In Excess, a band from Sydney, Australia, with the second biggest song of 1988, Need You Tonight. Up next, the number one song of 1988, the title song from the album of the year. Quick Fit's massive tire and exhaust sale is now on with a huge range of top quality exhausts with a two year free guarantee. But you better hurry. Get down to our sale. Pick up the phone now and call Happy Talk on 0898 555 888. Starry, starry night. Following the phenomenal success of The Greatest Love, Telstar will bring you The Greatest gray. Love 2. With Elaine Page and Barbara God. Dixon, plus Elton John this and Rod song. Stewart. A unique collection of 30 classic love songs with Sade, The Commodores and Queen. 30 major artists on one unbelievable double album can only be The Greatest Love 2. Don't miss it. The Payless DIY sale. Now on all across the country. With quids off all kinds of DIY. <gasps> and America's Top Ten continues. 
Now, before we get to the number one song of 1988, let's take a look at the top 10 songs of 1987. At number 10, Living on a Prayer. Nine, Shakedown. Eight, The Way It Is. Seven, Here I Go Again. Six, C'est La Vie. Five, Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now. Four, I Wanna Dance With Somebody. Three, Shake You Down. Two, Alone. And at number one, Walk Like an Egyptian. The number one song of 87. And now the number one song of 1988. It's the title song from an album that turned a star into a superstar. Once and for all, this album separated this singer-songwriter from his days as a member of the duo called Wham! and let us know that George Michael, the number one song of 1988, from the number one album of 1988. Now, time for our trivia question. It comes to us from Tony Morris of Salina, Oklahoma. Tony wants to know, what song spent the most weeks in the number two spot without ever making it to number one? Well, it's a song that spent an incredible 10 weeks at number two. The song ironically titled, Waiting for a Girl Like You by Foreigner. There's your answer, Tony. Thanks for writing in. Well, that wraps up our special countdown of the biggest songs of 1988, a year filled with some of the greatest hits of the decade. Till next week, keep your feet in the ground and keep reaching for the stars. Coming up next, the morning news from ITN. There's a host of stars for a new year. 1989. Our new series. Drama, comedy, variety, and great entertainment in a new look for the new year. This is the punishment block, where the incredible Intercity Amiga is undergoing the equivalent of a seven-year run. It's running mate, Aerial Automatic, a vital component in every Intercity. In fact, for reliability and performance, they'll give you an excellent run for your money. Only because of such gruelling tests can we confidently award a free five-year guarantee. Indicit Amiga, they just keep running. Only the lonely. The unmistakable voice of Roy Orbison no on the definitive I greatest hits album. Woman, 20 original street, hits from one of the true legends of pop music. Including Pretty Woman and Crying to Win Dreams and Blue Bayou. Relive the unique sound of the legendary Roy Orbison, the greatest hits on Telstar now.
Want to know all about the New Year programmes on ITV and Channel 4? Make sure you get TV Times. David Suchet talks of his role as Hercule Poirot in the new Agatha Christie series. We preview High Street Blues, drama with a difference, as shopkeepers battle with developers. Read how the cast of Wish Me Luck met real resistance heroes. Savour Hugh Johnson's advice about supermarket wine. And this week, get a free birth sign pendant and a half price senior citizen's rail card in TV Times. Thames. And next Monday at 7, wish you were here with John Carter. It's al fresco in Andalusia as I drive round the route of the White Towns. Wish you were here while Judas in Marbella. Spain has a reputation for cheap package holidays. In Marbella, though, it's top draw stuff. But where's Annika? Well, I'm in the mountains in southern Spain where the places are changeless. So is the transport, as you can see. Join the Wish You Were Here team next Monday at 7. On Thames. Hello, good morning. You're watching Thames from London on Friday the 6th of January. Our nighttime entertainment comes to a close now until Monday evening, when our programmes will include Alfred Hitchcock Presents, The Hollywood Movie, 60 Minutes and Sports World Extra. Right now, with the time coming up to 5am, we must hand over to Zaina Badawi at the studios of ITN for the morning news. The video which America says shows their planes were chased by the Libyans. Good morning, it's five o'clock on Friday the 6th of January. In a moment we'll be taking a detailed look at that video. And in India, troops are on full alert after the hanging of the men involved in the assassination of Mrs. Gandhi. Also in today's programme, how the French are developing the new video telephones. A special report on the world news. And from American television, a report on the stranded whale that's returned to sea. The Americans have released a video recording of the incident between US and Libyan fighter pilots over the Mediterranean. The pictures are of poor quality, but the recorded cockpit conversation between the two American pilots appears to support US government claims that their F-14 fighters repeatedly tried to escape from two chasing Libyan MiG jets. The seven and a half minute recording shows only flashes of the Libyan jets, but it does include the conversation between the two American pilots as they try to avoid the approaching Libyan minks, which they say forced them to alter their course five times. Okay, bogeys are jinked back at me again for the fifth time. They're on my nose now. One of the American pilots then opened fire. Box one, box one. Oh, Jesus. Fox one away means the F-14 has launched one of its Sparrow missiles. Good hit, good hit on one. Roger that. A kill, good kill. I've got the other one. Short Fox two, short Fox two. I got Fox two. Coming hard, stop. So. Shoot him. I don't got a tone. Got the second one. I got the second one on the nose right now. Hey, I'm high cover on you. Get him, get him, lock him up. Lock him up. Man, shoot him, box two. I can't, I don't have a stone. So what? Good kill, good kill. Hey, good kill. This slow motion replay shows the second Libyan jet being hit. The Pentagon claims that this photograph taken from the video shows that the Libyan minks were armed with four missiles. The Americans say a close-up of it shows a shape under the wing. President Reagan has said his pilots were right to shoot down the Libyan jets. And his opinion of Colonel Gaddafi? Meanwhile, the United Nations Security Council has adjourned an emergency session over the incident until later today. Non-aligned countries are considering a resolution which condemns the American action and calls on them not to make further attacks or threats. But any motion is likely to be vetoed by the United States unless it's moderate enough for them to abstain. 
The government has ordered all British airports to tighten security in the wake of the Lockerbie Air disaster. Transport Secretary Paul Shannon said the new measures, which include more searches, will apply particularly to American airlines. After a meeting of the Department of Transport, which continued until mid-evening, and which involved both the police and airport authorities, as well as government officials, Mr. Channon announced the increased security measures which will now come into effect. We're taking a number of extra steps uh, that I've decided this evening to increase the security of cargo, to increase the security of mislaid luggage, to further take further steps to increase security of hand luggage, and I shall keep the whole matter under review to see if there are yet further steps that need taking. That obviously means more rigorous searching, doesn't it? There will be more rigorous searching on American Airlines, and on other airlines as well? On any airline where the threat we think is commensurate, but at the moment it will be American Airlines. So, while the present arrangements at British airports will be upgraded, the measures stop short for the moment of the complete opening and searching of every single bag in the presence of every passenger on every flight. The sort of security, for example, that one airline, El Al, insists on. Nor is Mr. Channon introducing the high-tech sniffer machines on baggage that some MPs want. Police and troops are on alert throughout northern India this morning after the hanging of the two Sikhs involved in the assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. One report said Sikh extremists in Amritsar had threatened to set the nation on fire in reprisal for the executions. Satwant Singh, Mrs Gandhi's killer, and Kihar Singh, accused of plotting the murder, were hanged at a jail in Delhi earlier this morning. Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated in 1984 in retaliation for her order to the army to root out Sikh extremists in the Golden Temple at Amritsar. Thousands died in the communal violence that followed her funeral. The criminal conspiracy charges against the former Colonel Oliver North, the man at the centre of the Iran-Contra scandal, are almost certain to be dropped. Mr. Lawrence Walsh, the independent special prosecutor, says he won't pursue the charges because the authorities won't release key documents which Mr. North claims he needs for his defence. President Reagan says the papers are classified. North, whose trial begins at the end of the month, still faces charges which could lead to a 60-year prison sentence. Eddie the Eagle Edwards has been readmitted to hospital after coming home from his latest skiing accident. Yesterday, he returned from Austria, where he'd fractured his collarbone and bruised a kidney during a ski jump. He's in Cheltenham General Hospital, where he's expected to spend the next few days under observation. After the break, the major foreign stories on the world news, including how the French are developing the latest in telecommunications, the video telephone. Sounds like a glue. Oh. Capital growth bond. Perhaps a bit long-winded. Didn't someone suggest capital bond? The National Savings Capital Bond. Everybody happy? Oh, I still love Then we may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Drink it in one. Oh, yes. Good idea. Oh, yes. If someone would like to put the kettle on. I'll see to it. Thank you, Rob. And let Audrey know, would you? It's capital bond. Thank you, Ron. The new capital bond from National Savings. Don't miss out. Working your way through a cold can feel like a long day's journey. Your nose is blocked. Your throat is dry and sore. Paul's Menthalyptus has a special vapor action that helps your cold let off steam. Soothing your throat, unblocking your nose, helping you get through to the end of your day. 
Paul's Mentholiptus, vapor action for your nose and throat. Welcome back. Now with the time at nine minutes past five, we have the major foreign stories on the world news. The program was first seen by viewers in America and Japan last night before the United States released the video of the shooting down of two Libyan planes. I'm John Suchet with the World News from ITN in London. We'll bring you the top international news and a business report. Among the stories we'll be covering, Pentagon accuses Libya of lying about the air battle. Key charges against North likely to be dropped. Soviet minister will meet Afghan rebels for talks. First, America says it has proof that both Libyan MiG jets shot down over the Mediterranean on Wednesday were armed. But Libya has told the United Nations Security Council the aircraft were not carrying weapons. The United States says it has a video showing the MiGs were armed with missiles. President Reagan said he had not believed anything Colonel Gaddafi had said in a long time. He said our pilots acted completely in self-defense. They did the right thing. But the Soviet Foreign Ministry spokesman, Gennady Gerasimov, said such actions, being as they are a show of political adventurism and state terrorism, may bring about serious consequences. Right, but I'll go on quickly. Officials at the Pentagon emerged from their briefing with the F-14 crew today to declare the U.S. airmen had acted in a prudent manner to defend themselves and their ship. The Americans admit their pilots couldn't see whether the Libyan MiGs were armed but say it was obvious that they were. As one of the pilots said, it's a pretty dang fool question as to whether you're carrying weapons or not. We certainly assume that any nation's fighter aircraft are carrying weapons. That's why they're built. A key question has been whether the F-14s were aware of a hostile radar lock-on from the Libyan MiGs. The F-14s in the air did not detect a... Uh, a a radar signal. But we have other indications that their radars were, were on. How important was it to the decision to fire? The Not, at all. Not at all. Not at all. Bob. That decision was based on what the Americans say were the clearly hostile movements of the MiGs after they left their base 80 miles away. You understand what I'm talking about here. Uh, the aircraft are in this position initially. The the MiGs take off and they turn directly toward our aircraft. Our aircraft then are on a collision course with them. In order to avoid that collision, our aircraft turn first this way to avoid it. The MiGs turn. Our aircraft turn back this way again. The MiGs turn. That way, the MiGs turn. And they went through this maneuver five, six times. Ronald Reagan made his first comment on the incident as he left Los Angeles for Washington. Our pilots acted completely in self-defense, he declared. They did the right thing. Pentagon experts spent much of the day studying the videotapes from the F-14s. Tapes, they say, show one of the Libyan MiGs was carrying four missiles. Libya's ambassador to the United Nations, who said the MiGs were on an unarmed reconnaissance mission, dismissed those tapes as meaningless. They can have pictures from other planes, so can do anything like that. They, are, they know the international community is condemning them for this act. And the Soviet ambassador made it clear that Moscow's sympathies lie with Tripoli, not Washington. You don't think it was justified that the U.S. Uh, thought it was under Absolutely attack? Absolutely not. Why not, sir? Why not? Because there are no proofs that there was any danger for the Americans. But, I mean, if you wait too long, you could get shot down yourself. You know, foreign policy issues should not depend on the actions undertaken by lieutenants. The Americans hope the seven minutes of videotape they have will support their case. Newsmen, given a preview, report the pictures reveal little. But they say that the recorded conversations of the F-14 crews show that each time they took evasive action, they were pursued by the Libyan MiGs. 
In Libya, public buildings have been specially fortified amid fears that the United States could be planning an attack on the country itself. The Libyan government summoned all the ambassadors of Arab countries and called on them to take a united stand against America. It also requested an emergency meeting of the Arab League. The Libyan capital Tripoli appeared calm today despite some news agency reports that residents were fleeing in anticipation of a major American attack. The mood was very different on Wednesday, only hours after the Libyan planes were shot down. Big crowds gathered and chanted anti-American slogans. The demonstrators also swore to take revenge. The government newspaper said the incident was linked to the arrival in the area soon of 13 more American warships. It claimed this showed clearly the United States intended to attack Libya. There were also reports that the city's defenses were being strengthened and Libyans remember the devastation caused by America's last airstrike against Tripoli in April 1986. Before America shot down the Libyan jets, Washington had said it would not rule out an attack on what it claims is a chemical weapons plant. Libya says it's a pharmaceuticals factory. Ironically, what is almost certainly an accidental encounter has sort of lanced the boil of national frustration, both over the chemical weapons plant and ironically over that tragedy over Lockerbie, Scotland. Uh, we've uh, bashed a terrorist, and I think Ronald Reagan, who is the consummate uh, understander of the national mood, uh, wants to move on and get the military option out of the way. The country's leader, Colonel Gaddafi, described the shooting down of the two planes as an example of official American terrorism and Libya has called for a special session of the Arab League. The former White House aide, Oliver North, may not have to face criminal charges as a result of the Iran-Contra scandal. The special prosecutor in the case has asked for all the main criminal charges against Colonel North to be dropped. It's thought the request will be granted. The independent prosecutor's request comes just a few days after Mr. North's lawyers issued subpoenas for President Reagan and President-elect Bush to appear as defense witnesses. Colonel, now Mr. North, was due to go on trial at the end of the month. He faces charges arising out of the alleged diversion of $12 million of funds from the Iran arms sales to the Nicaraguan Contras. The Scottish town of Lockerbie has begun to bury its victims of the Pan Am jumbo jet disaster. One was an 81-year-old widow. The other, 10-year-old Joanne Flanagan. Her parents died too, but their bodies have never been found. Lockerbie's Holy Trinity Church was packed with relatives and friends for this funeral, which has touched the entire community. Leading the mourners, Joanne's brothers, David, who's 20, and 14-year-old Stephen, seen here on the right. They also lost their parents, whose bodies have not been recovered. Deepest grief today is felt by Joanne's brothers, Stephen and David, and by the family and relatives of our parents, Tom and Kathy. The whole community shares in your grief. And so we pray today they will be together, happy in heaven. Joanne's body was one of only three recovered from the 11 local people who died in this disaster. As the funeral cortege travelled through this small, shattered Scottish town, it passed by Sherwood Crescent and the crater where her home once stood. In Lockerbie's cemetery, representatives of the emergency services were among the mourners. Father, son. Relatives and friends have promised to help and support Stephen and David as they try to recover from their loss. As the family comforted one another, Joanne's brothers left behind their final farewell. Glenno Glaser, ITN, Lockerbie. An exercise by two French television journalists to test security at New York's John F. Kennedy Airport ended with their arrest for attempting to smuggle fake bombs. The two journalists from the French company TF1 were led away in handcuffs by New York police. They apparently tried to send the fake bombs as freight cargo with three different airlines. One of the devices was discovered by security staff. The fake bombs contained wires, clocks and batteries. Officials said the journalists' action was a waste of police time. 
An international express train has crashed in Yugoslavia, killing seven people and injuring more than a hundred. Two Americans and two West Germans were among those hurt. The express from Munich in West Germany hit a truck on a level crossing 40 kilometers northwest of Belgrade, the Yugoslav capital. Rescue teams were trying to reach trapped passengers and police said more bodies were believed to be buried in the wreckage. The Supreme Court in India has rejected last-minute appeals to save two Sikhs condemned to hang for the assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in 1984. The men, Kehar Singh and Satwant Singh, are due to be executed early on Friday morning. It's been announced in Pakistan that a Soviet special envoy is meeting leaders of the Afghan rebels there on Friday. Yuli Voronsov is on a shuttle diplomacy mission aimed at setting up a broadly based government in Afghanistan. His talks are becoming more urgent as the date draws closer for the last Soviet forces to withdraw from Afghanistan next month. Mr. Voronsov has been discussing the future of Afghanistan with Pakistan's President Benazir Bhutto. For the Afghan President Najibullah, time's running out before his Soviet protectors leave. The last Russian troops have to be gone in six weeks' time. Fighting's reported to be underway in a number of Afghan provinces, even while Mr. Varonsov is trying to hammer out some sort of a peace deal with the rebel leaders in Pakistan. He now says the Soviet Union will recognize a broadly based Afghan government after the troop pullout. Mr. Voronsov went to Saudi Arabia last month for his first meeting with leaders of the Muslim rebels who are based in Pakistan. He's since travelled to Tehran for talks with the other Mujahedin factions who are based in Iran. It's clear from the intensity of his shuttle diplomacy that the Kremlin really is trying to reach an agreement with its enemies of the past nine years. But Moscow still insists that it has no intention of simply abandoning President Najibullah. Even the former king of Afghanistan, Zahir Shah, has been brought into Soviet calculations. In the hope of ending this destructive conflict, Mr. Varonsov went to Rome and tried to persuade him to return home. The king said no. The Mujahedin are split between those who want the king back and those who want a pure Islamic state. They decided this week to hold an assembly of commanders, intellectuals and political leaders. That could hold the key to the fate of Afghanistan after the Russians go home. Now business news. The European community is considering imposing strict duties on American imports of dried fruit and walnuts. These imports are worth $100 million a year, the same sum as a number of European exports already subject to similar US sanctions. With that and other business news, here's James Forlong. This European proposal is the latest step in what's becoming an increasingly bitter trade dispute between America and Europe. Community ministers are likely to make a decision on whether to implement these proposals when they meet later this month. Italian products are among the hardest hit by American import duties, which were imposed after a European ban was imposed on American meat treated with growth hormones. A United Nations report says the world economy in 1988 grew at a faster rate than at any time since 1984. The report contradicts most forecasts which had predicted a slowdown in economic growth. But it warns that imbalances in trade relationships among the major developed market economies continue to threaten the stability of the international economy. Some other business stories in brief. A European community report says inflation is on the increase in the community and now stands at its highest rate for almost three years. The report estimates the annual rate was 4.2% last year, up from 2.6% in 1987. West German Federal Labour Office figures show that an average of 2.24 million people were unemployed last year, up by 13,000 on 1987. And the British luxury car maker Rolls-Royce says its worldwide sales rose by 10% in 1988. They even showed an increase in North America where sales of many other luxury European models have fallen. And now the closing prices and by the close of trade on Thursday in Europe, the dollar had resisted West German attempts to slow its advance and remained firm on speculation that US interest rates may rise soon. Gold continued to fall. At London close, bullion was down $2 an ounce. 
North Sea Brent Blend Oil was trading 10 cents a barrel higher. The FT100 stock index gained 6.5. And on the Frankfurt Bourse, the DAX was up 6.02. And I can bring you one other closing figure. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed up 12.86 to its highest level since the 1987 October crash. Now, our special report. One of the most revolutionary developments in the history of telecommunications is fibre optics technology. Fibre optics have led to the video telephone, so long the dream of science fiction. Much of the technology was developed in Britain. However, its introduction has been hindered by lack of investment and a row over who should supervise many of its applications, the telecommunications company or the cable television authority. In France, however, there are no such doubts. Biarritz, not so much a glamorous resort for princes nowadays, or a sunset home for France's elderly bourgeoisie. It's also the testing ground for the world's biggest experiment in the application of fibre optics technology. Under the city centre streets, strung from suburban telegraph poles, 10,000 kilometres of fibre optic cable has been laid. In these improbable surroundings, a thousand subscribers have been linked to a communications revolution. This is a video phone. The dream of generations of science fiction writers has finally been realised. All you need is this bit of kit. It's a telephone, a camera, and a screen, all in one with a dining pad. And of course, you need the fiber optic link. On the other end of this link now is Jean-Jacques Terry of France Telecom. Mr. Terry, how long has it taken to develop a video phone? Uh, the, the concept of fiber optics is, is, is an old concept, uh, but in laboratories in the 70s, the fiber optics looked very promising, but uh, it needed to be used uh, to, on, a, on a normal network to know if uh, really it could be extended to a large scale. That's the reason why the Biarritz experiment was created. For the past 10 years, the Biarritz experiment has been developing applications for fiber optics. Bonjour, madame. The video phones being used in a community policing experiment, giving the town's many elderly residents visual contact with their local hobby bobby. Madame finds it formidable. France Telecom, though, is more concerned with commercial applications. At the old casino, a video library is being built up. The subscriber calls up a list of films in stock and the times they're available to be shown. At the video library, the request is registered and at the appropriate time played out to all the subscribers who requested it. It's just this kind of development opportunity that the British fibre optics industry is looking for. No one doubts that fibre optics can revolutionise communications. The question, especially in Britain, is who is going to pay? Britain leads the field in the technology of fibre optics, using beams of light to carry information down threads of pure glass. The inner core of a fibre optic cable is one hundredth of a millimetre thick, finer than a hair. It's coated in a low refractive material to concentrate the light and then coated again in plastic for protection. Fibre optic cable can carry as much information as conventional cabling ten times as thick. It can carry sound, data and picture simultaneously. But the real revolution is that it's capable of interactive or two-way communication on a single fibre. BT has already laid 300,000 kilometers of fiber optic cable, mainly on long distance routes where old copper wiring needed replacing. But linking up the entire country would cost 20 billion pounds. Just before Christmas, a government-backed committee rejected state funding for a national fiber optics grid. The opposition says without it, Britain's lead and much else could be lost. From its office on the site where Marconi once worked, BT distances itself from that political argument. Instead, it argues that it could raise the money itself, but only if its license obligations were relaxed. We have the chance to have a British lead. We have the only fully liberalized, privatized telecom authority in Europe, and that gives them a freedom and gives the British government a freedom to allow market forces to come to play. I don't want government subsidy, far from it, but I, 
uh, what I do want is government support. With Biarritz's government-backed experiment, it's even possible to order flowers by phone. And to see what you're choosing. BT is now asking for a special dispensation from the ban on carrying pictures so it can run an experiment like this one. But clearly the technology can be made to work. The real challenge will be the battle between the telecommunication and the television industries. Now a look at how some of Friday's newspapers are reporting world events. West Germany's Die Welt says the Libyan leader Colonel Gaddafi has called on Moscow to send warships to Libya. The international edition of the Financial Times says the US moved to galvanize its allies into united action against Libya. The International Herald Tribune reports that the Pentagon spokesman called Libya's chief United Nations delegate a liar by asserting the two MiGs shot down by America were unarmed. And the European edition of the Wall Street Journal says that Poland, once a cradle of Jewish culture, is finally exploring its role in the Holocaust. And that's the world news. I'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Goodbye. After the break, we'll be seeing what's making the news on American television, including how a stranded whale was returned to sea. When even the mutt knew she was bored with our lifestyles and pretty drastic action was needed, at Ligno Rose Furniture, I found the answer. French chic en vogue, it had style, panache, the love. She didn't say much when she came home, but I think my wife was impressed. Ligno Rose, 130 Shaftesbury Avenue. We're going to come and live here soon, Timmy. Install a total heating system and your home is suddenly a warm and cosy place. It's a system that makes the most of less than half price electricity to give you continuous, controllable warmth and a tank full of piping hot water, yet can cost as little as £597 for a one-bedroom flat. What have you been up to? It's going to be nice here, Mum. Not central heating, Total heating. Every day, thousands of jobs are waiting to be filled. In fact, one in three firms predict skill shortages will affect output. That's why the government is investing in employment training, and why companies like IBM, Wimpy, Sainsbury's, Pilkington, Ferranti International, and ICI are committed to ET. So let's train the workers without jobs to do the jobs without workers. Details phone 0800 24 6000. Welcome back to ITN's Morning News. It's 5.32 on Friday the 6th of January. The Americans have released a video recording of the incident between U.S. and Libyan planes over the Mediterranean. It appears to support U.S. government claims that their F-14 fighters repeatedly tried to escape from two chasing Libyan MiG jets. Meanwhile, the United Nations Security Council has adjourned an emergency session over the incident until later today. Police and troops are on alert throughout northern India this morning after the hanging of the two Sikhs involved in the assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. The two men were hanged at a jail in Delhi earlier this morning and there are fears of reprisals from Sikh extremists. The government has ordered all British airports to tighten security in the wake of the Lockerbie disaster. Transport Secretary Paul Shannon said the new measures which include more searches will apply particularly to American airlines. The main news will be coming up at about a quarter to six. Next, to look at what's making the news on American television. The Pentagon says the release of their videotape proves Libya lied about the dogfight over the Mediterranean this week. 
These reports are selected from CNN, America's 24-hour cable news network. Libya's ambassador to the United Nations is maintaining that the Libyan jets were unarmed reconnaissance aircraft. That's despite today's pictures from the Pentagon. Late today, to reinforce its claim, the Pentagon released these pictures showing what it says are two types of missiles on one of the Libyan MiGs. U.S. officials say the plane carried two AFIT missiles for close-in combat that must be fired from behind the target. The Pentagon says the MiG also carried two Apex missiles, radar-guided and lethal at long distances. And it was these the U.S. F-14s were trying to evade, if necessary, by flying close to the water. The Pentagon says these pictures are proof. Uh, it tells me that the Libyan ambassador to the U.N. is a liar. That's the first thing it tells me. Uh, because they have, they've gone out yesterday and said repeatedly that those were unarmed reconnaissance aircraft. Well, we have the pictures now to prove that they were not unarmed aircraft. This latest tension between the United States and Libya is stretching the limits of any civility between these countries. CNN World Affairs correspondent Ralph Benkleiter reports, though, that while the United States has repeatedly denied Libyan requests for direct talks, the two countries are communicating. Within hours of shooting down two of Muammar Gaddafi's jet fighters over the Mediterranean Sea, the United States began sending formal diplomatic messages to Gaddafi, explaining and justifying the U.S. action. To be sure Gaddafi gets the message, the State Department is sending it through two channels. Through Belgian diplomats in Tripoli, who represent American interests in Libya, and through the United Arab Emirates Embassy in Washington, which represents Libyan interests in the U.S. The message makes the same points announced publicly by Defense Secretary Carlucci. It says the American fighters fired in self-defense over international waters and says American military exercises in the Mediterranean pose no threat to Libya. Gaddafi has tried repeatedly in the past year to engage Washington in talks to improve relations, always sending his messages through diplomats from other countries or through businessmen with interests in Libya. He's a madman, but I, there's no congenital reason why we could not have better relations with him if he behaves himself. Secretary of State Schultz has regularly ignored Gaddafi's overtures, saying Libya's support of international terrorism and his opposition to Arab-Israeli peace are obstacles to improved relations with the U.S. The State Department is now repeating that message. The problem is not one of communication. The problem is the policy and the conduct of the government of Libya, their policy particularly in support of, of terrorism so that informal back-channel messages will not take care of this basic problem. American officials say they will start taking Gaddafi's overtures seriously when he makes them through established diplomatic channels and when he demonstrates that Libya will stop supporting terrorist groups with money, intelligence, and a base of operations. Ralph Beglatter, CNN at the State Department. The United States is getting some support for its assertions that Libya has built a chemical weapons plant. Britain today repeated that it has independent evidence to back the U.S. claim. It called the Libyan plant a very formidable new capacity for chemical arms. But a British official notes that producing chemical weapons is legal. He says Britain would not endorse a U.S. military strike against the plant without firm justification in international law. And the Soviet Union appears to have changed its position. Yesterday, the Soviets called the U.S. charges groundless. But today, a Soviet general acknowledged that Libya may indeed be able to manufacture toxic chemicals, but in amounts, he says, too small to wage war. For weeks, the White House has refused to turn over to the prosecutor sensitive secret documents to use as evidence against Oliver North. Because of that, today, Prosecutor Lawrence Walsh asked that the two key conspiracy charges against North be dismissed. A report from CNN's Anthony Collings at the Justice Department. Never commented Nine yet, months after former White House aide Oliver was indicted, independent counsel Lawrence Walsh moved to drop the two most important charges against him, conspiracy and theft. Walsh said he did this because the administration refused to release hundreds of classified documents needed at the trial. The administration denies it stonewalled on the documents. It praised Walsh's move as useful. This action should go a long way toward reducing the risk that uh, classified security information 
uh, might be uh, compromised by a public trial. Walsh backed down on the charges one day after meeting with Thornburg. Walsh apparently got no and, uh, signal the administration would release it. North's lawyer said the heart of the case is now destroyed. The chief counsel for the Senate Iran-Contra committee called Walsh's decision prudent. The matter of declassification, when you have a scandal involving national security, is a genuine problem. There were matters that uh, we were made privy to on a classified basis that no citizen would...